Simone Claxton here, president and founder of the Sophia Miriam Foundation. Welcoming you yet another day to the Dream Big Girls Empowerment Program. It's now 10, 12 a.m. Atlantic Standard Time. And I'm talking to you from the beautiful Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome my CARICOM sisters and brother, Ricardo. It's wonderful to be here. How's everyone today? We are motivated and enthused to be with you again. Thank you, Commissioner Cole. It's a pleasure to have you in Guyana with us. Thank you very much and your ladies there. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Marilyn. Is that Marilyn? Uh, everything is good there. Blessed. Nice. Perfect. How are my ladies and Dominic are going? Good morning to everyone. Good morning. My ladies in Suriname, how are you going? Hi, Cindy. Hi. Hi, Hi, Dorothy and Hi. <laughs> Wonderful. Hi, Hello. Lisa. Hi. So it's another wonderful day. Glad to be with you. Today we have two topics. One is climate change, and the other topic is puberty, hygiene, and sexual education, which we'll do after. That one will be around approximately 11 o'clock. Grenada. Good morning. Good morning. Is that Grenada in the house? Yes, it is. Wonderful. Lovely to have you all with us today. Beautiful. So we're going to play a short video clip. Does anybody know what, um, what climate change is about? No, I don't know what that is. Maybe okay. because it's in English, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Anybody knows what climate change is? So the weather changes day to day. Okay, sometimes it rains, on other days it's hot. And um, climate is the pattern of the weather condition over a long period of time, over a large area, right? And climate can be affected by the Earth's atmosphere. So we're going to look at this quick video and then we'll get a better idea as to what climate change is about. Ah, somebody says for us to do a change in the weather. Okay, so it's the climate change, climate patterns over a period of time, right? So let's have a look at this video and um, we'll soon find out what climate change is about. Wonderful. So do we have a better idea as to what climate change is about and why climate change is important? Right, guys. So let's let's have a discussion. What's uh, climate change about? Why is it important? In the video, it says climate change affects our weather. It affects our food. It affects our health. Right. That's why it's important. Because if, if it's affecting your food, it's affecting agriculture, it's affecting crops, whether it's easy or difficult to grow crops. It's affecting the water systems. You need water for your crops to grow. And if you don't have water and it's difficult to grow crops and agriculture is difficult, then we have less food. Okay, and everybody has to eat. So climate change is very important because it affects our food. It affects the weather patterns. We live in the Caribbean. We have hurricane season in the last half of the year, latter half of the year. And if we keep having worse and worse hurricanes. I mean, some of us have first-hand experience with regards to hurricanes and the devastation that it causes. Yeah. So climate helps us predict how much oh. rain the next winter might yes. bring. Okay. I at least read it that um, overdue exposure to sun can also cause skin cancer. So if it's also too hot out there, and you have to go out there every day and the sun keeps you keep getting exposed to a large amount of sun for a large quantity of time daily it can eventually cause skin cancer yes that's correct so because of the greenhouse gas effect carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gas effect the sun is becoming hotter and hotter with the effects of climate change and more exposure to the sun will put you at risk for skin cancer okay and other diseases it affects our health Okay, and affects our health in the way that it traps more smog. It increases the smog, especially in those large city areas. Okay, then the air quality is very poor. If we're breathing in 
poor quality air, then our lungs would not be able to get the right amount of oxygen that we need. And if our lungs and our body not getting the right amount of oxygen, then we wouldn't be able to function to our maximum to keep our bodies healthy. Um, may I? Sure. Uh, okay. We have what is called the bees. I've been watching at what's happening to the bees. And most recently on International Bee Day, I think we had uh, an actress trying to show you the importance of bees to our climate. Um, yes. The bee population, uh, because of climate change, is uh, some of the bees have disappeared altogether. And if we understand the importance of bees to our food and how they are able to uh, pollinate, I think um, we should be concerned and be more uh, aware of what is happening uh, even with those natural insects, the insects that help us to get food. And here in Guyana right now, uh, May, June is our rainy season. And um, we have a level of water rise. We have 10 regions and nine out of the 10 regions uh, have various communities on the water. We have a crisis right now here. We have um, the Civil Defense Commission. Yeah, uh, people crops are flooded out. Their homes, um, an area called Kokwani in uh, Region 10. You have to see the level of water, and people are saying that uh, they've never seen that water before. And Guyana is on the sea level, six feet below sea level. So uh, more so, we have to take uh, every precaution. And most recently, we had a foreign company that was allowed to grade down our mangroves. That, 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 that is a natural protection to our sea. That's an environmental crime that um, I think that the government has really um, uh, allowed a foreigner to do that to us, to grade down our mangroves and then to tell us that they will put back what? Concrete sea defense. Nothing is more important than your natural sea defenses and mangrove forests are known to be that. I thank you. Thank you very, very much, Commissioner Cole, for those comments. You are so, so right. One of the main things you mentioned there, the bees. And it is said that without that tiny insect, the bee, without the, the bee, we would have no life on the planet because the bees are so important in pollinating. Right? We need the bees and those tiny insects for pollination. And without pollination, we would not be able to have the flowers turning into food, right? fruits and vegetables. So we would not have food. So as you, you rightfully said, the population of bees are dwindling because of the effects of climate change, because the, the atmosphere that they're custom operating in is changing. And therefore, they haven't been able to adapt to it. And therefore, the population will dwindle. And hence, we'll have the consequences of um, agriculture, you know, food production, difficulties in food production. And also the mangrove. The mangrove is a very, very um, natural defense, as you said, for um, for the atmosphere, for for sea, for sea defense, it's very it's very instrumental. I mean, removing the mangrove is really it really is a crime because we really need our 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 forests, our mangroves now to help us with um, carbon emissions. You know, to reduce our carbon emissions. So thank you very very much. Does anybody else want to contribute to the um, topic of climate change and its impacts on us and on our health, on the weather? Um, for example, the weather conditions in Guyana um, at the moment, the weather conditions will continue to get worse once climate change continues in the way that it's going at the moment, especially for small island developing um, states, because normally the, the landmass is so small, if the sea level rises, which is what um, is taking place with the climate change, your sea level is rising, then your land will eventually get swallowed up with the rise in sea level. And as uh, indicated by Commissioner Cole, Guyana is already under sea level. So therefore, that hence the reason why they're having those problems at, at the moment. Uh, um, um, Simone, I would like yes. to say something about Yes, that. yes, Italia. Italia here. Um, what I want to say is our actions that cause climate change. Let us get that straight. The human activity, that the things that we do, the way we, we treat our environment has now come back to bite us. So we now we we now are trying to change what we do in order for us to bring things back the way they were. And um, we always think that we know better how to treat our environment better. But the environment takes care of itself. 
But when we go and we tamper with it, like uh, Commissioner Cole talked about, removing the mangrove, this is yes. an entire ecosystem. And I think one of the things is that is because we do not understand ecosystems. When you remove stuff from the, from the ecosystem, something else because it's going to happen because if there's a lot of bees and there's a lot of this is because there are other things to eat so it's a big food chain that you're taking off when you take off a food chain then you 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 put in your you opening yourself to other things happening because the other in animal that used to eat that before or the insect that used to eat that before have to find something else to eat and and then the other one have to find something else to eat or sometimes you wipe off an entire system Hence, you're going to kill off some things. You're going to destroy the environment. It is just a domino effect. So anything you destroy, you know that something else will happen. The entire ecosystem now is a domino effect. It's a, it's a result of human behavior, what we do. So I just yes. want you to be conscious of your behavior when you hear about climate change. It didn't just happen. It happened because we didn't treat what we have well. Definitely. Thank you very much. Um that contribution, Natalia, you're, you're so right. It, it off balances the ecosystem, right? And that is what happens. And when the ecosystem goes off balance, when you manipulate or interfere with one aspect of it, it throws everything off balance. And this is what we are reaping now, the consequences of throwing the ecosystem off balance, right? And as Natalia is so right, um, there are things that we are doing right now that are, co that are causing and leading to these problems. And we'll see throughout the next couple of videos what we could do in order to help right as you've been seeing playing the these wonderful photos these are photos of various um, natural attractions all over the world and we want them to continue to exist we want them to to be there in another how many years to come we want to be able to visit them uh, we want our children and our children's children to be able to visit them so if we don't do things to to mitigate the effects of climate change we will not have some of these wonderful attractions that we're seeing on screen right now okay so we're going to move into the second uh, video. That's beautiful. That's uh, that's uh, the peach. Yes, <laughs> in Venezuela it is. It is. No, and this is um, this is bordering on Guyana too. <laughs> yes, it's three countries. It's yes, actually, when I read up on it. It's like three countries is bordering. Yeah, on. yeah. I Guyana think it's um, I think it's uh, Guyana, Venezuela, Venezuela, and Brazil. Yes, I, I believe it's right there. It was so amazing when I saw it. It's, it's a that's this plateau, you know, it's really amazing. So I must say that we do not own the rights to these videos. Um, these first couple of videos are from and photos are from National Geographic. Um, so we just want to acknowledge that it's been, they're being used for educational purposes. Right, my ladies, let's have a discussion about the video. What are your thoughts? Huh? I actually do not totally agree with her opinion because she is trying to eliminate plastic, but at some point you will need certain things that are made of plastic. I think we should just be more um, conscious about our choices and how we dispose the plastic. Not only the inhabitants of the country, but also the government needs to make sure that when, that the plastic is disposed properly in a healthy way or recycled instead of just ending up somewhere on the streets or in a, a river or ocean because we we still need plastic at some point you still need certain things made of plastic thank you very much uh was that is that shivani Shayan, right? Yes, Cheyenne. Cheyenne? yeah. Thank you very much, um, Cheyenne. Great point there. We will need to use plastic at some point in time, but the idea is to minimize, is to reduce, reduce the use of plastic. So once there are alternatives, and what this video showed us is that um, these are the dangers of plastic. You know, it harms the um, the animals on land as well as the fishes, etc., in the sea. And these are some of the alternatives. So instead of using balloons at your party, you can use paper decorations, right? Um, instead of all the plastic wrappers on your um, your lolly, you can make your own lollies, okay? So it's just so showing you alternatives. So the whole idea behind it is basically the three R's, which are to reuse, reduce, and recycle. So what we have to try to do is to 
reuse things rather than throwing away stuff. OK, because then we, we create more waste, which is the point Shen was making. Right. Um, it's difficult to get rid of plastic. Right. Once you throw it away, it, it, it's there all the time. It doesn't disintegrate very fast. So you have to reuse stuff. Uh, we have to try to because once you're reusing stuff, there's less need for new products, because even when you're producing and manufacturing new products, uh, there's a certain amount of carbon emissions that goes into production and manufacturing. So the more new products you keep producing and producing, the higher carbon emissions. And the whole idea of climate change is to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that goes out into the atmosphere, which is creating the greenhouse gas effect that we saw at the beginning, right? That, that are creating the changes that we're experiencing, the rising sea levels, the heating up of the planet, etc which is leading to the changes in our weather patterns, uh, more severe hurricane seasons, winters, etc. OK, so we have to reuse stuff. We have to try to reduce the use of plastic and other bad um, products. And we have to recycle. OK, so there's things that we can recycle glass and plastic. So instead of dumping, we recycle the plastic and the glass. OK, so that we can use it again to make more more products. So it's about reducing, reusing and recycling. Yes, and I see somebody sending me those three hours there. OK, guys, so that's the whole aim behind that video. Anybody has any other comments? I wanted to uh, make the point that the very car that you get in to drive is contributing to the damage of the ozone layer. Yes what comes out of the exhaust. So this is why there is a move to have more, uh, quote unquote, electric cars or cars that use ethanol, a more uh, uh, climate friendly fuel that is more better for the environment. But um, not many people want to give up their, uh, their fancy Jeeps and their Prado here in Guyana. We put so many cars on the roads. Um, yesterday, I saw a strange phenomena. The ambulance is trying to pass and the ambulance have on the sirens and it's beeping the horn. But the lanes are so filled. Where are the cars even moving to let the ambulance pass with a patient who can lose their life? So the very cars and we have this, uh, we tend to want to buy the latest SUV. But um, right now we have to think about um, whether our own vehicle that we drive is contributing to the spread and that is what is happening. Um, yes, I've seen more countries move towards um, bicycle, having bicycle lanes and encouraging people to use um, what we call um, electric scooters or um, uh, vehicles that are more climate friendly. So um, even in uh, reducing, are we prepared to reduce our use of fossil fuels that, um, that is within our cars and our SUVs? Many people wouldn't want to ditch their fancy rides. I thank you. Yes, Commissioner, thank you. That is so, so true. Anybody else wants to make another point? I have another point to make. Something yes, very, sure. very important. Um, I don't see people talking about it, but I think it is necessary to talk about the same body sprays that we use. And I, I'm not talking about um, body splash or mist or something. Not, not, not those. I mean body sprays like the ones you use for your armpits, like um, Rexona or Dove, all these things, they are stored in a certain can, right? Air fresheners. They don't necessarily have to protect, I mean, have to damage our ozone layer, but the way we discard is very important. If you discard, if you just throw it somewhere or you burn the cans, it releases the, the, the elements that the can is made out of, if it is discarded in a wrong way, it can release toxic gases, which destroy our ozone layer. Also, I think the, the um, gas um, that motor in your refrigerator has and your freezer, if it is not, if it has expired or something, I forgot how it actually works, but what I'm trying to say, if you do not dispose of it in a proper way, it can actually damage our ozone layer and also cause climate change. So as I was, as I said before, we need to make better choices when it comes to discarding certain products. 
because that really matters more than we can actually imagine. Yes. Thank you very much, Sharon. That is so, so important. The uh, they call aerosols, those um, body sprays and cans, and the use of them as well as the disposing of them do contribute to pollution and to um, the destruction of the ozone layer. So that is a very, very um, important point. Even as she mentioned, the refrigeration, um, the gases in the refrigerator, um, if those things are not handled in the right way, they can contaminate um, our atmosphere. And as Commissioner Cole right, rightfully said, our the vehicles that we use, fossil fuels we use in our vehicles, they contribute as well. And the thing is, what are our choices? Are we prepared to, to give up, you know, and, and to sacrifice in order to preserve the planet? Because many may not want to give up their, their nice fancy rides, you know, but um, the fossil fuels do contribute. So there's a movement more towards electric um, vehicles now, more user friendly um, and ozone friendly fuels, and even the trend towards bicycles. For example, in Asia, they use a lot of bicycles, um, you know, like in China and stuff. And, and they try to create an atmosphere, bicycle lanes, and create an atmosphere where persons will be more encouraged, you know, not to purchase cars, but more use um, bicycles, which are more um, friendly to our atmosphere. So instead of traveling in a car, okay, some of the things that we could do, because um, sometimes we think we may not be able to change, you know, the earth or, or make a difference, but some of the things we could do instead of traveling in a car or using, you know, um, public transportation, we can walk right we can ride our bicycles okay um here in trinidad most households have at least two vehicles and there's a lot of congestion on the road just as commissioner cole was saying there's a lot of traffic a lot of the times and it's because we have too many cars on the road so sometimes instead of everyone using a separate car we can pull together carpooling or maybe public transportation and sometimes instead of even public transportation if you can walk the distance or ride on your bicycle right um, bike, biking or walking, for example, like 10 miles each day, instead of riding in a car can save for the year 1.9 uh, tons of carbon dioxide entering into the atmosphere. So you can save the planet some carbon dioxide entering into the atmosphere if you choose to say walk or take your bicycle, etc. cetera, in dis to distances that are, you know, short. If we reduce and we reuse things as much as possible, as I mentioned before, it would um, reduce the amount of new products that we have to be uh, manufacturing because manufacturing does emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, right? So we would be able to reduce the amount of emission of carbon dioxide due to manufacturing of new products. Um, electronics use a lot of um, energy. So what we can do is turn them off or we can unplug them as well. Right, we will be will also save on our electric bills if we unplug our appliances while we're not using them. One other way is um, buying locally grown and in season foods and products. A lot of times we like a lot of the foreign foods and fruits, etc. But if we consume what is locally grown, it reduces the emissions for transporting the foods. Because if we use what's grown within our area, there's less transportation, less fuel, less burning of fossil fuels used in transporting the goods as opposed to if we use goods that have been transported you know hundreds or, or you know how many miles away which means it has to take the airplane and then the, the truck and you know the train and everything and that's increasing the amount of um, carbon emissions okay um as Shanna was mentioning we can get you know not only just us but you know government officials and stuff they need to be aware and they need to be involved persons in authority we can talk to our parents the adults around us um you know the mayors in our towns and our political representatives and get them on board you know in, into you know putting regulations and laws and rules in place to reduce to recycle to reuse things within our our community and within our country anyone else has any contribution towards this discussion so feel free to open your mics and we can have an open discussion. Can you can you hear me? Sure. Um, Go ahead, Alia. Oh, okay. Living in like a city, like many, like you kind of see like the first hand effects of climate change a lot, because like even on the un underground, like there's a lot of pollution. And that's because you know London can be like packed with cars and there's always buses going and stuff like that. 
and like I think that was one of the main reasons my friends and I were like so willing to be active in like the climate change protests in like in 2019 and you kind of realize then that like climate change like legislation put in place by government bodies is you know just as important and crucial than like less consumption of like meat and dairy and plastic like that's great too but you also kind of need the government to be on board and like one of my friends is is actually a, a member of Extin extinction rebellion which is a group of you know of like activists and they use like non-violent civil obedience to kind of draw attention to like environmental issues and compel the government to like take action to avoid social and ecological collapse and like a loss of biodiversity and you kind of quickly realize that in, instead of like the government taking responsibility and like accountability for mining and entering and like disrespecting indigenous lands they kind of place the blame on the little people and practices that they've like encouraged have put others at a disadvantage because like thrifting like over here has become like really popular recently which is weird because I can remember being in high school and like getting something from like the second hand store was like a crime but like now it's become so popular like a lot of thrift stores have hiked up the prices because like it's it's a cool thing to go in and thrift now but that means it's kind of put poorer families who can't afford like bigger stores at a disadvantage because now they can't afford things that they needed to get in there and you kind of like messages of, of young activists like Greta Thunberg um, you know who sat outside the Swedish parliament every day for months instead of going to school and like Mari Kopany who is um, like actively trying to get clean water into Flint, Mich Flint, Michigan because they've been in like a water crisis for nearly seven years. It kind of brings it all back to that kind of idea of balance because like in the words of the Kogi people from Colombia's uh, Sierra, Sierra Nevada mountains you know there are secluded indigenous people who have only ever spoken openly to the outside world like twice in the last 600 years and both times have been to basically warn us that we aren't attuned to nature and we're kind of lacking that balance and they believe and you know they're quite right that the ecosystem we live in is delicate and there are these like critical interconnections that exist between the natural world and they say that what happens in one specific site on the coast can be like echoed miles away in the mountains because at the they believe at the beginning of time you know mother nature laid a thread linking each site to the other therefore damage caused by like logging and mining and building like power stations and and construction of like ports along the coast and like at rivers for nothing more than basic global capitalism kind of results in not only the destruction of natural resources but it severely affects kind of what happens at the top of mountains so like mountains that once had you know white capped peaks are now brown and bare and lakes are parched and the trees and vegetation are kind of withering and they say while they don't expect us to change everything that we're doing now an empathetic kind of relationship to the land and what grows on it is the way forward and kind of what we need to build on and i think that's like a really good thing to keep in mind that like even if you can't change everything about the way you live now you, you can't get rid of the car or you can't you know get rid of all the plastic or you, you can't change to a completely plant-based diet just remembering to like pick up garbage or avoiding something in, in like exchange for another thing and kind of developing a relationship with the land and with the animals and with plants and stuff is kind of a good thing to do because it kind of reminds you like we do only have one earth and if anything goes wrong with this there is kind of nowhere for us to go Thank you very much, Leah Nevada, for that contribution. Uh, we need more advocates, basically, for climate change, um, is her point. We need more persons advocating. Um, we need governments involved. We need the authorities involved. You know, it's, not, it's okay for us as the, you know, the small person on the ground to make that change, but change needs to come from higher up. So that's very, um, very important, because the destruction of our natural resources would lead 
to increase climate change. Okay, and as we see, we want the earth to remain as beautiful as it is. Anybody else wants to contribute before we move on to the last uh, couple of videos, which will be on advocacy. So we can see other young persons like yourselves advocating for climate change and why climate education is so important, especially now. OK, so we're going to play the um, last couple of videos on climate education and advocacy. Those were from Climate Changers site. Uh, they're for educational purposes, as we do not own the rights to those videos. So ladies, climate change and how we can be part of it, how we can make a difference, how we can help to keep our planet as beautiful as it is. So we're going to be closing off this discussion, unless anybody else wants to make a comment, and moving into our second segment. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, may I? Yes, yeah, sure, Commissioner, go ahead. I just wanted to make a final point, which is important. Coral reefs, um, and it's here in the Caribbean, uh, climate change is actually uh, damaging the coral reefs. And if uh, we study what the coral reefs are, they're very important to the ocean. And um, the coral reefs, I think, uh, there, there is in Barbados. In, the, in our beautiful sea, in most of the Caribbean islands, um, the coral reefs is part of the attraction for tourists who do a lot of snorkeling and, um, and stuff like that. They, um, the natural uh, habitats in the ocean, they feed off the coral reefs, but with the coral reefs gone, uh, what will they be left to feed off of? And um, that is another phenomena that we need to guard against uh, the damage to the coral reefs in the ocean. I thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Commissioner Cole. That is so, so true. A lot of the islands have corals and they are really in danger due to climate change. So ladies, we see where we can make a difference, where we can save our planet and preserve the beautiful islands and territories that we live in. Right, so we're going to be moving over to a very um, special and sensitive topic, a very welcome topic, puberty, hygiene, and sexual education. I'm going to touch on that a little bit. We have with us a very special guest all the way from Canada, and she's Miss Kayla. She will be with us today. She's already joined the room. Um, I'm sure some of us might be able to see her. So she is a sexual education and um, sexual health specialist and she will be with us. So we're going to have an open session. We're not going to go into breakout rooms. Um, after she delivers her uh, topic, we'll have like an open discussion. Um, at the point in time of the open discussion, um, we would not be recording and that will give you um, an opportunity to openly ask um, all your questions. Don't be afraid. It's a, a relaxed forum where we can share and we can ask questions, you know, any concerns. Um, it will just be females alone. We would not have Mr. Ricardo Mitchell with us at that point in time, ladies, and um, it will not be recorded. So you'll be free to ask, you know, any questions, um, you know, and be open as you like, right? So we're going to be moving into our puberty, hygiene, and sexual education segment with Ms. Kayla in Canada. All right. Right, Kayla. So it's just us ladies here now. So we have an okay. appointment. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, I do have the option to share. Good morning, everyone. As Simone said, my name is Kayla, and I'm up here in Canada, which makes it maybe uh, even better that I'm the one talking about puberty and hygiene and a little bit about sexual health because guess what? I don't know any of your parents. I don't know any of your teachers. Um, I'm not going to get weird if you ask any questions. So I definitely encourage everyone to, if they have a question, to be brave enough to ask it because I guarantee if one of you have has a question, there's more than one of you that's you know, wondering. So I definitely encourage that. Um, 
And you know what? I'm going to approach this topic just neutral, fact-based. Um, I think it's really important that everybody has the same information. And I know, um, you know, there's an age range, um, you know, of girls in this group, maybe as young as 12 and as old as 19. So some different things will apply, or maybe you've learned, maybe you haven't, but at least everybody will have the same information. So before I start talking about puberty and hygiene and all that good stuff, um, if all of you, um, if it applies to you, could just like raise your hand on um, the, the chat. So have any of you ever had a discussion with a parent or a teacher about puberty or hygiene or sexual health? Right, I see a couple hands going up. 10, 13, 14. All right, hands are going up, this is good. I'm happy to see that. All right, okay, lots of hands are going up. So if you wanna put your hands down now. Good, thank you. Um, all right, and so almost all the hands are down now. There's still three, three up. Um, all right, so now I wanna put, want you to put your hands up if you felt comfortable having that that discussion with the person? Was it easy? Did it feel okay? Did you have any questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking? Okay, this is good. There's seven, eight. All right. Okay, 12. All right. All right, you can put your hands down, everybody. Thank you. I just wanted to get a sense of um, how things work, because I know that there's people from several different countries. Um, the kind of education you're going to get is going to depend greatly from where where you're from, what your parents are comfortable with, what your teachers are comfortable with, your your religious background, and um, a lot of different things. So, all right, I'm going to go to this. All right. So um, we are going to talk about puberty. And like I said, there's going to be some of you that it's like, oh, this is old news. And for some of you, this might be really useful information. And you know what? I wish when I was younger that I had learned more about this. So hopefully this is good for all of you. Um, so what is puberty? So basically, it's the age or period during which the body of a boy or a girl matures and becomes capable of reproducing. But reproducing or having a baby is a pretty adult thing to do. So you don't want to do that before you're ready. Um, so going through puberty doesn't mean you're ready for a baby, but it's basically the time when your body develops and grows in order to one day handle that adult task. So puberty is just basically the process of your body beginning to move from childhood into adulthood. So basically, it's just a sequence of events in which physical changes occur, resulting in adult physical characteristics and the capacity to reproduce. But like I said, reproduction is an adult task. So what actually happens during puberty. There's a lot of things that are gonna be happening, but sort of the technical part of it is um, there's physical changes that are gonna be regulated by changes in levels of different hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland, which is a small little gland in your brain. So that's the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. So when you're first born and a baby, you have high levels of these hormones in your body and then they taper off and then they return early in puberty. Um, so early in puberty, these hormones are gonna start to increase and that's gonna stimulate the production of the sex hormones, which are estrogen and progesterone. Um, so the increased levels of sex hormones primarily estrogen, result in physical changes. So that's gonna mean the maturation of the breast, 
your ovaries, uterus, and vagina. Normally, these changes occur sequentially during puberty, resulting in sexual maturity. So that's the sort of the technical side, but what does that actually mean and what is that going to look and feel like in your body? So your body is going to change a lot. So that's going to mean your hips will get wider, your body's going to get curvier, and you're also going to grow taller. Um, unfortunately, not all things are good with puberty. So you um, may start getting oilier skin and develop acne, and acne can look different in different people. Some people get a lot, some people get a little. Um, you know, it could be on your face or chin or neck or chest or even your upper back. And that's that's normal. It's kind of just, um, you know, the luck of the draw in terms of uh, what kind of skin you end up having. So your breasts are also going to start growing. Um, the first stage of breath breast growth is called budding and I just want to normalize that it's totally normal for your breasts to be different sizes um, and also for your breasts to be tender when they're when they're growing so even as adults we still sometimes have breasts that you know aren't exactly the same size humans aren't perfectly symmetrical um, and that's totally okay and normal don't freak out um, in addition, hair is going to start growing on different parts of your body. So you might start noticing hair in your armpits and um, maybe the hair on your legs and arms starts to get darker. And hair is also going to start growing in around your pubic region. That's normal. And how you decide to take care of your hair, whether you decide to remove your hair or not, that's okay. That's that's a personal choice. Um, in, a, oh. in addition, um, you're going to start noticing some vaginal discharge. So you might notice something um, kind of clearish or whitish in your underwear, and that is totally normal. Basically, um, that's the part of the self-cleaning process. So your vagina is pretty smart and it's going to clean itself. So if you start to notice some discharge, that's okay, no need to freak out, that's, it's normal and healthy. Um, you're also gonna start to smell more than before and have a stronger body odor. So what happens during puberty is you develop a new type of sweat gland in your armpits and in your genital areas. And all over your body, you have this skin bacteria that feeds on the sweat that this type of gland produces. And that's what can lead to body odor. Um, and of course, some, some point during puberty, you are going to experience your first period or menstruation. So for most people, this will happen somewhere between age 11 and 14 or 14 and a half, although anywhere between age nine and 16 is considered normal. So all of these changes will be happening in your body and you're like, okay, what's the big deal? Um, but because your body is changing, your hygiene habits need to change too. So hygiene just refers to the conditions or practices that are conducive to maintaining health and preventing disease, especially through cleanliness. And then how can you practice good hygiene? So bathing and showering regularly every day if possible. Um, and you wanna pay special attention to your armpits, your genitals and your feet. So your armpits and your feet um, are going to be pretty smelly if they're not already, and your genitals too. It's, it's good to keep them clean and healthy. So in order to clean your, your vulva or your vagina, uh, you don't need to do anything crazy. You just need to use warm water and a mild soap. So you don't want to use um, any sort of scrub or antibacterial wash, and you don't want to douche. And if you don't know what douche means, 
It's basically a method to wash out the vagina, usually with a mixture of water and vinegar. Um, some douches are sold in drugstores, but they contain fragrances or you know other things that your body and your vagina doesn't need. And you know if you are using antibacterial scrubs or um, or you're douching, you can actually irritate the vagina, and that could lead to infection. So you don't need to do that. You just got to keep it simple. Use warm water and a mild soap. Um, it's also important to wash and change your clothes regularly. Um, this basically helps reduce the build, helps reduce the buildup of bacteria and avoid body odor. Um, so you want to especially make sure that you're changing your undergarments because they're close to the skin, the closest to the skin and after physical activity because you're sweating more. And um, if you don't already, you might want to consider using deodorant or deodorant and or antiperspirant and that's going to help with the body odor that you might suddenly realize that you have when you start going through puberty. So deodorant is going to help with the smell from your armpits and antiperspirant is going to help control how much you're actually sweating. So they're both going to help with body odor. And so um, the last thing I want to mention in terms of hygiene is you want to continue or start if you don't already practicing other forms of good hygiene. So that's brushing your teeth every day, flossing every day, and washing your hands regularly. All right, so because of the way the presentation is I can't see any of you, which makes it a bit strange just talking to my screen, but I do want to talk um, about periods. So I'm going to exit the slideshow for a second and I want to go back to see all of you. You're here. Um, okay, so um, again, I want you to raise your hand um, if you have ever had a conversation about your period with your mom or your sister or an aunt, anybody like that. All right, some hands are going up. 20, 21. All right. That's good because it can be kind of freaky if you don't have the conversation ahead of time. All right, thanks. You can all put your hands down now. You girls are great. So good at this. All right, hands going down. All right, almost all the hands are down. Still seven up. Um, all right, so now I want you to put your hands up if you feel comfortable talking about your period with other people. So hands are going up. No, I see a head shaking. No, you don't feel comfortable talking. No, I see another. I can only see two, two, two of you girls and both of you shook your head no. All right. So some hands going up, less hands going up. Okay. All right. So now, oh, I see somebody else now. All right. So there's definitely less people. All right. You can put your hands down. So basically, you know, the world makes a really big deal about um, getting your first period. And in some ways it is, but there's still a lot of you know, like shame or stigma or embarrassment around getting your period. And I remember getting my period. I was 12 years old and I remember going into the bathroom at school and I needed to change my um, sanitary napkin. And I was so embarrassed. Like I was trying to open the package so quietly so that nobody else in the bathroom knew that I had my period. And it's so silly because, you know, I'm in a girl's bathroom and all girls are going to get their period at some point. 
And yet, for some reason, we still feel like we can't talk about it. So I really, really want to normalize um, periods because it's a universal experience. It's a sign that we're becoming a woman and that one day, if we choose, we are going to be able to uh, reproduce. So hopefully, um, you know, this is something. Is there a question, Shalina? No? Okay, put your hand down. Shalina, did you have a question? I can see you, so you can shake your head. No, okay. No, I didn't have a okay, thanks, Shalina. Um, yeah, so I just really want to stress that it's a totally normal experience. And part of the problem is that we aren't told that enough. And for some reason, we try to make it a big deal or we're embarrassed and we really shouldn't be. And half of the problem is that boys will also tease us about it. So we might not have even ever had a period. So I remember before I got my first period, I was in a bad mood and my older brother you know, it was just like, oh, why are you so grouchy? You must be on your period. And it's, you know, part of the problem is that boys aren't educated on periods either. And I think they really should be. What do you guys think? Do you think boys should also be educated on periods? No, I, I saw a couple heads shaking yes. I do. And a couple heads shaking no. Brittany, did you want to say something? Saw your mic came off. I think they should get educated on the subject. Yeah. Anyone else want to share their, their thoughts? Yes? No? Thanks, Brittany. Jonas? Um, I can't quite hear somebody's trying to speak. Um, is there anybody that does, doesn't does think that boys should be educated on their periods and on periods and want to share why they think that? Don't worry, be brave. This is a safe, safe space. Anybody? Okay. That's okay. <laughs> Shalina shaking her head. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's totally okay. Um, I personally think that boys should be educated so that there's less shame around, you know, when girls have their period. So boys aren't giving you a hard time when you have your period because your body is working. Periods can be really uncomfortable. You can be bloated. You could be cramping. You know, you could have a headache or back pain. Like, we, we can suffer during our period. It's different for everybody. But, you know, wouldn't it be nice if uh, boys were nice to us? <laughs> yes, it we certainly would. That? May I? <laughs> yeah, who's speaking? Uh, this is Commissioner Cole from Guyana. Uh, oh, okay, please. South America. I, I just wanted to highlight a significant point. I am uh, a former vice president for the Guyana Rastafari Council. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out what happens to the women in the community when they are seeing their period and how men banish them from the kitchen. They can't cook. They can't do so because the period is seen as being unclean. And it's a scripture that is taken from the Bible. So with the period, um, women are treated so inhumanely, which for me is more dogma than, than, than anything that relates to science. The period is a natural process of a woman's uh, body and um, it, it tells you about life. But for the men, uh, uh, some of them in, in religious faiths, they use it to discriminate and to really attack women. And so I think indeed that boys should be educated uh, not to fear the woman. She's unclean, she is this, she is that. Um, they they're, they're what we call um, period huts. 
uh, and, you, and, and the students can go on YouTube and research the period huts in countries where the girls are sent into a, a area whereby it, um, they can be bitten by snakes and all of that just because they are seeing the period. So um, education and awareness to boys will help to change uh, this dogmatic um, approach. I do not subscribe to the rubbish okay, I, that a woman is to clean when okay. she is uh, seeing her menstrual period. So I just wanted to highlight how religion is also using a period to discriminate against women and girls. I thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cole. Was there someone else that was trying to speak there? No? All right. Um, Kayla, I just want to say thanks, um, Commissioner Cole, for your input. And I just want to say that this segment has been sponsored by AMCO in Trinidad, Austin's Marketing Company Limited, uh, based in Shagonas. And they have donated some personal hygiene items, uh, pads, liners, uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and um, dental floss for the girls. So no matter where you are, we will be getting those products to you at some point in time. Okay, so we want to thank our sponsor, AMCO, for sponsoring this segment and we also have another sponsor on board at this moment which is the Unitrust Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago so just want to mention them so go right ahead Kayla all right thank you all right I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint which means I'm not going to see all of you but we're going to keep talking about um periods for a little bit all right um you can see the PowerPoint again everyone yes um, ma'am yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So why do we all menstruate and what actually happens during menstruation? So basically you get a period um, because your body needs to release tissue that it no longer needs. So every month your body is actually preparing for pregnancy. So what's happening is the lining of your uterus gets thicker in preparation to nurture a fertilized egg. So in that, in that lining is going to be all sorts of nutrients that if an egg is fertilized, it's going to help it grow. Um, an egg is then released from the ovaries and is ready to be fertilized and settled in the lining of your uterus. So if the egg is not fertilized, your body no longer needs the thicker lining of the uterus, so it starts to break down and it is eventually expelled along with some blood from your vagina. And that's basically your period. And once your period's over, this process starts all over again. So it's gonna happen for many, many years of your life. So, you know, as Commissioner Cole mentioned, Imagine if you were living in a place where every month you got your period, you were banished away. So that's going to be a lot of time um, when, you know, you're going to be away because you have your period, which isn't unhygienic. It is natural and normal. And if we didn't get our period, then we wouldn't be able to reproduce. So it's, it's really, really a normal thing that I want to stress to all of you and you know what for some some girls they might um, bleed a lot um, some it might not be too heavy and it might seem like you're releasing or you know getting rid of a lot of blood but for most girls it's only about two or three tablespoons of blood and sometimes you might notice um, something that's kind of like a bit chunkier a bit thicker sort of like jelly and that's just part of the tissue that's coming out that's also normal and no reason to panic so probably most of you have heard you know the term menstrual cycle and if you don't know what it means it just refers to the time from the first day of one period to the first day of the next period so cycles are usually between 25 and 35 days. Um, but when you first get your period, so when you're younger and you're still going through puberty, it's okay and normal to have irregular cycles. So whether that means that you got your first period 
and then you don't get your second one until two months later. Um, or I remember there was one time I had my period twice in one month and I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's important to know that if your cycle, your menstrual cycle isn't normal yet, that's okay. Cause it does take a couple of years. And for some people it can take up to six years until your period is normal and regulated. So probably this is a good um, thing to ask, or you know, you've wondered about why you're having mood changes during your period. So experts, Experts aren't sure of the exact cause of mood swings, but it is likely linked to hormonal fluctuations that happen during the second half of the menstrual cycle. Um, so ovulation happens about halfway through your cycle. And during this time, your body releases an egg, causing estrogen and progesterone levels to drop. And a shift in these hormones can lead to both physical and emotional changes. So ovulation just means it's the release of an egg from the ovary for possible fertilization. So it's going to come from the ovary down the fallopian tubes and settle into the uterus and the lining that your body has been preparing. Um, so then it's also good, maybe more of an answer for these mood changes that most likely all of us have experienced. I know I definitely have. Um, so changes in estrogen and progesterone levels can also influence serotonin levels and serotonin helps regulate your mood, sleep cycle and appetite. So when you have lower levels of serotonin in your body, um, that's linked to feeling sad or irritable and you might have trouble sleeping, you might have unusual food cravings. And these are all things that are commonly linked to PMS or premenstrual syndrome. I know that many times throughout my life, you know, I've been feeling particularly sad and I'm like, what's going on? Why am I crying at, you know, this commercial on TV? And then I get my period and I'm like, ah, <laughs> yeah, that's why. So um, it's totally normal for some people, um, you know, the, the PMS feelings um, can be worse or, you know, not really existent, and it can change from month to month too. So that's also normal. So what else do you need to know? So it is normal. I want to stress it is normal for your genitals or your vulva to smell a little bit musty, like sweat, or even a bit metallic around your period because there should be iron in your blood and that has, um, you know, a metallic smell. So if you smell, if you have your period and it smells a little bit different than normal, that is okay. Don't freak out. Um, it is also important to know that beyond the mood swings you may experience around your period, you will probably experience other emotional changes throughout puberty. So these could be things like uh, the need to be more independent, or you might start feeling a greater sense of self, you're figuring out who you are, and you might start to have a sexual interest in other people. And this is a process that we all go through, through puberty. It's gonna happen at different times for some people, so it might happen earlier for you, it might happen later for your friend, and that's okay, like there's, there's no timeline, there's no rush um, for any of these feelings. Right, so the next thing I want to talk about is healthy relationships. So I'm just going to exit out of this again so I can see all of you. All right. Okay. Okay, so I just want you to raise. Oh, I guess it doesn't work this way. So if maybe somebody is comfortable speaking, I'm wondering what you guys think are important qualities or important aspects of a healthy relationship, whether that's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a sexual relationship. What are important qualities? Be brave. 
good communication. Yes. Yeah, who's speaking? Quinisha. Quinisha, thank you. Anybody else? Um, um, I would say understanding, like, if you can um com communicate, but also understand them, like, it's not all about the communication, you also have to, like, um, understand what the other person is saying. Definitely. So it's one thing to listen to somebody, and it's another thing to understand somebody. And sometimes it takes a little bit more work and effort to actually understand like truly understand what the other person is saying so yes that is a really good one anybody else patience patience yeah definitely they're all tying in together anybody else what's that you're very quiet Question. Did anybody else catch that? I didn't. Simone, did you hear that? Yes. What was the question? I'd like you to repeat the question. We're, we're just talking about um, aspects of a healthy relationship. What are the different parts of a healthy relationship? And 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 Jelly and Jaylee. Rolanda? Um, I think sympathy. Okay, yeah. All right. What about mutual respect and respect for each other's boundaries? Yes, that is a really good one. Mutual respect is really important. Um, to be able to set boundaries and respect each other's boundaries is really important. Yeah, you guys are great. You're, you're listening to a lot of really important things for healthy relationships. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint now. All right. So um, those of you that provided examples of um, things that are important for healthy relationships, that's great. You you guys have already done wonderful. So I'm going to go through um, some, some more. So communication, that was the first thing that uh, somebody suggested. Uh, and it is really, really important. So everybody in the relationship should be able to communicate their feelings, opinions, and beliefs and be respected. Um, so you might want to think about um, do you feel like you can communicate honestly and openly to your romantic or sexual partner? Because if you can't, um, that, that could be problematic, right? Because you should be able to do that and feel good about communication. Boundaries. So um, another one of you brought up boundaries and respect. So that's fantastic. You're already, you're already ahead of the game. So boundaries are physical, emotional, and mental limits or guidelines a person sets for themselves, which others need to respect. Both you and your partner should feel comfortable in the activities you do together. So they should, the activities that you do with your partner should both be within your boundaries. So you don't wanna cross somebody's boundaries and make them feel uncomfortable and nobody should cross your boundaries and make you feel uncomfortable. So that's where the respect come in, comes in. So regardless of the type of relationship you think, you should think about what you want the relationship to look like and talk about it with the other person. So boundaries aren't just for you and your romantic or your sexual partner boundaries are for friendships um, boundaries are for relationships between you and your siblings um, those ones are always harder to set um, i know i have three siblings um, but it's important nonetheless that you're able to set those boundaries and that the other person respects them 
So trust and honesty. So each person in the relationship should have confidence in one another. So if you're in a relationship, whether that's, you know, a friendship or a romantic relationship, and you're questioning whether to trust someone, it may be important to communicate your feelings to them. Talk about, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble trusting you and I just want to have a conversation about it because I'd like to, you know, I like you and I'd like this relationship to work. So when you're thinking about why you don't trust someone, you might want to consider, you know, why, why is it? Is it something the person did? So did you tell us something? tell them something in confidence and they told someone, or is it the way that they behave? Um, or is it even something that ex that you've experienced with, you know, other friends or other romantic partners in a different relationship and that trust or lack of trust is now being brought into this other relationship. So those are things to consider. Honesty, you know, trust and honesty go right hand in hand. And being honest is, really important for communication. So each person within the relationship or friendship should have the opportunity to express their feelings and concerns. And if you don't feel comfortable being honest with someone, consider why you don't feel comfortable. Do you want to be friends with or do you want to be in a relationship with someone you can't be honest with? That doesn't sound like a you know, a very enjoyable experience. Like you want to surround yourself with people that you can be your true self, you can be honest with. So if you're in a relationship and you can't be honest with that person, you should consider why and maybe you should, um, you know, talk to a trusted adult or talk to somebody else, you know, seek support elsewhere in order to figure that out. Independence. So you might be wondering what that has to do with a healthy relationship, but it is actually important to have time to yourself in any relationship. So that could be your very best friend and you want to spend all your time together, um, or that could be at the beginning of a relationship when you're in your little love bubble and that person can do no wrong and that person is, you know, so attractive and smart and funny and you just want to spend all of your time with that person but it is actually good um, to have opportunities to hang out with other people, your family or your friends, um, and to take time for yourself to practice self-care, whatever that looks like. Um, and that's actually really good to maintain a healthy relationship. And this is something that I really wanna stress because you know, it's not just when you're younger and you're figuring yourself out that you'll get into a little love bubble and you know, want to spend all your time with the person that you like. That happens as adults too. Um, so if you're practicing, you know, being independent now and spending time for yourself, um, even within a relationship as an adult, that's also going to serve you well. Equality. So each person in the relationship should have an equal say in what's going on. So again, this is going to boundaries. So you want to listen to each other and respect boundaries. I don't think anybody wants to be in a relationship where they feel like they are less than the other person. So a healthy relationship is about giving and taking. So sometimes it, you might find yourself in a relationship where it feels like you're just giving and giving and giving and not getting anything in return. So you might want to have a conversation with that person to talk to talk about what's going on and make sure that both of you are being treated with respect and getting something positive out of the relationship and that you're on equal footing. Support. So it is very important that whatever your relationship is, that it's a supportive relationship. So each person should feel supported and it's important to have compassion and empathy for one another. So you try to understand what the person is going through or what the person is saying. If they're going through a hard time, try to have compassion for that person. And in addition to supporting one another, 
it's important to recognize your own needs and communicate boundaries around support. So um, sometimes what happens in relationships, romantic or not, is that one person may need more from the other person. So maybe they're going through a hard time and they really need a lot of support. And I know that this has happened to me in my own life with both friends and romantic partners. So, you know, a friend that, you know, is struggling with their mental health really needs a lot from me. And you know what, it starts to affect your own mental health as well, because you're experiencing their sadness or their stress as if it was your own and it starts to feel really, really heavy on you. So you also need to know, again, your boundaries. So you wanna be there and you wanna support the person, but if it starts taking a toll on you, you might wanna say something like, you know, I like you or I love you and I know you're going through a hard time and I wanna be there to support you, but you know, I have a limited capacity, you know, I don't have an area of expertise in the things that you're going through. So maybe you should um, seek somebody that is an expert in this area, but I still want to be there for you. So something like that. Responsibility. So this happens to all of us, you know, no matter the age, sometimes we might say something to another person that is hurtful and we might make a mistake. Making mistakes is part of being human. Um, the trouble is even us as adults, humans in general, aren't very good at apologizing and taking responsibility for um, your actions. So you have to take responsibility for your actions and not blame the other partner. Well, I acted this way because you did this. That might be true, but that's that sort of dialogue or conversation isn't going to be supportive or uh, create an environment where you have a healthy relationship. So it's important to apologize. And you know what happens oftentimes, you take responsibility for your actions and you apologize, you know, I, I, I uh, miss, I didn't mean it that way. This is what I actually meant. I'm really sorry that I hurt your feelings. I hate that I hurt your feelings. I don't wanna do that again. Um, and, you know, sometimes it might just be a miscommunication and you just have to explain and go back and forth and understand, um, you know, sometimes what you say and what you mean isn't received by the other person in, in that way. So adults are also really bad at apologizing and it's something that I have been working on, you know, my whole life is learning to apologize because Sometimes we're very stubborn um, and sometimes we're just embarrassed. Like we're embarrassed we made that mistake. Uh, we feel bad that we hurt somebody and then we don't know how to make our way back and apologize. But I promise you, if you start taking responsibility now for your actions when you've hurt somebody, you know, when you made fun of somebody, it's going to be a lot easier as an adult and you're going to have healthier relationships and that's taking responsibility is great for further developing trust and honesty safety so safety should be the foundation of a connection in a relationship so it should be you know ground zero the very foundation of the relationship both people should feel safe so if you don't feel safe, you're not going to be able to set boundaries, you're not going to be able to communicate, and you're not even going to be able to have fun. So in order to do those things, everyone must feel safe and comfortable in the relationship. So if you're in a relationship and you don't feel safe to express your feelings, you know, take time away from the relationship or anything else that we've already talked about, you should seek support from someone you trust because Something is amiss, um, something isn't quite right because you should always feel safe and comfortable uh, in all of your relationships. Healthy conflict. So um, 
even the word conflict uh, has a negative connotation. We think conflict, conflict is bad, but there is such a thing as healthy conflict. So if you are having a disagreement with somebody, you know, a friend or a partner, that's not necessarily a sign of an unhealthy relationship because talking about issues or disagreements is normal. Because you know what? It is not realistic that you are going to find a person that has the exact same interests as you, has the exact same opinions, has the exact same beliefs as you. So naturally, you're going to have some disagreements. Um, and that's okay because communicating your feelings and opinions while being respectful and kind is part of a healthy relationship. It's normal. And this happens, you know, to me as well. My, my partner and I don't always agree. And sometimes that can be really hard because you think that you're right. Um, but the thing with feelings is feelings aren't right or wrong. There's something you feel. You know, you can't control that. Sometimes you feel a way you don't want to feel, but it's it's feelings. So it's just important to be respectful. And again, it goes back to mutual respect and understanding. So really trying to understand people, the other person. All right, so see if I can exit out of this, go back to the screen. All right, so now we're going to talk about sexual decision making. So we've gone through puberty, what's happening in your, in your body. We've talked about what a healthy relationship looks like. And sometimes it's good to know what a healthy relationship looks like because we don't necessarily have a good example of it. And Sometimes we model the behavior that we see, but that isn't the best um, behavior. So now we're going to talk about sexual decision making. So has anyone, and just raise your hand if this applies to you, has anyone ever had to make a really tough decision? So just raise your hand if you've ever had to make a really tough decision about anything. All right, some hands are starting to go up. Five, six, seven, nine, ten, twelve. Only twelve of you have ever had to make a tough decision? I think that's not true. Thirteen. Okay, 15, 17, 18. All right. So there's, yeah, there's more people, hands going up. You've had to make a tough decision. All right, you can put your hands down. Hands are going down. All right. So now put your hands up if you've ever had to make a tough decision and you made that decision and you still weren't 100% sure it was the right decision. So you had to make a decision, you did it, but then you're like, uh, was that the right decision? Yeah, more hands are going up, much quicker this time. It's hard, decision making is tough, even if you have all the information. Yeah, yeah, it's lots of people, it's hard you know, come becoming an adult or even, you know, as a kid, it's hard to make decisions. So it is, can, you can all put your hands down. Thank you. So making decisions can be really difficult and that's a normal thing. And so when it comes to making a decision about whether or not you're ready or you want to have sex, that can be even more difficult because every person has different beliefs, different values, different opinions on the matter of sex. Um, a lot of people aren't comfortable talking about it. Um, we don't really know what we want, what it means. So it can be very difficult. I'm gonna put this back up. May I make a point? 
You may. Thank you very much. Uh, here is where I will bring the law into the discussion uh, as it relates to consent so mm. that everyone is aware in Guyana, the age of consent is 16 years old. In Guyana, I don't know if that obtains for Trinidad and the other CARICOM territories, but in Guyana, the age of consent is 16. That means that anyone who engages in sexual intercourse with a person who is not 16 is committing statutory rape. I just want to make that very clear that the age of consent is 16 years old. So in the sexual decision making, it has very much to do with what the law of the country says. Uh, as it relates to statutory rape, for our report in 2020, coming from the Child Care and Protection Agency, we have 70 teenage pregnancies. All of the girls are under the age of 16. All those pregnancies, so they did not make, they were not at the age to make that decision there. So uh, what has happened to them in law is a crime. And so we want to ensure that when we're gonna speak about the sexual and reproductive rights, we have to ensure that we talk about the aspect of the law and how critical that is. I just want to highlight some things that occurred just uh, on the 27th. I traveled into a community to unearth a hidden pregnancy of a 14 year old. She is not at the age of consent. And so a crime has occurred there too. And this is just uh, on the 27th. But for the year, I would have unearthed three uh, on the age girls, 14, 13, 14 already that are not at the age of consent, age of consent. Those are crimes and should be punished in a court of law. I thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner Cole. Thank you, Commissioner Cole. May I interject, Kayla? Yeah. Yeah, just um, you thought you made it to, um, also where 16 is the age in um, St. Lucia as well for consent and um, Deborah has posted it's 18 in uh, Trinidad for consent. Um, yeah, normally around that 16 and under if, as Commissioner Kuhn has said, if the activity is engaged in, the person is held for um, statutory rape. So um, let me just mention before you move on, Kayla, that um, we just want to thank our sponsors. We have the Unitrust Corporation on board now, and um, we want to thank AMCO, Austin's Marketing Company in Trinidad as well specifically for this segment they have sponsored personal hygiene um items for all the girls which will be sent to them at a later date so in moving on with this topic um i want to discontinue the recording right so that the girls will be feeling free to um you know open up and discuss because i think we're moving into a more sensitive topic and um they'll be feeling more free to open you know whatever i shared here um obviously will remain here um if anyone you know needs any further help or have any, any concerns etc we can you know take it up you know and, and give you that specific help um if you have any specific you know situation that you need um help with. so i'll just continue the recording and you can continue um kina thanks All thank right. you very much for that uh miss claxton because in in the group of girls here we may have girls who are being abused and this should be a safe space where they can reach out and let us know what is happening. 